At some point, I decided to go to HR, go to the Office of Equal Opportunity, and that was terrifying. It was terrifying because it was like, you are doing a bad thing, you are exposing something that we have been trying to keep secret, and you know, this is the way things go, sorry you don't like it, you know, kind of attitude. I have always known for human resources in any type of organization to be somewhere to go to get something resolved. That was never the case. Even the, like the simplest thing, you're like, oh my God, I wanna avoid going to HR. It's gonna be a hot mess. <laughs> so, so you go to HR to get a problem resolved. You end up made to feel like you're the problem. Right. And how dare you right. bring this how across the desk. How dare you, you know, say anything? How dare you make a complaint? Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni. I'm here with Megan Smith. She is a student at Adams State who then went on to be employed both in the Department of Finance and also in admissions at Adams State over the course of about seven years. As a student, she served as the student trustee for the Board of Trustees and also was a formative force in the creation of the Black Student Union. As an employee, Megan was the first African-American professional staff and talked at length about some of the experiences, challenges, and observations she had in that capacity. Megan talked about some of the problems that she encountered while working specifically in the Department of Finance and a different set of challenges in the admissions office recruiting students to come to Adams. Made some observations about issues of diversity on campus as well as the financial commitments Adam State's make. Megan talked about some difficulties with regard to leaving Adam State and how she ultimately went on to recognize the value she brought to the institution, even when at times she found the environment to be hostile and stressful to her own well-being. All that and more on this edition of the Watching Adams podcast. <music> Megan Smith. I was a student here at Adams State. I came here in 2009 from Chicago. A single mom trying to decide what I wanted to do in life and try to find my path and exposing myself to a very, very rural area, challenging myself in ways that I normally wouldn't do. Um, I took a huge risk, kind of separated myself from my family and very, very close friends. And like, what are you doing? You're going to, are you going to Alamosa? So you have There's people in there. Chicago that thought you were kind of crazy. Yeah, they were like, what? What are you doing? And same thing now. It's like going back. People are like, what were you doing? So let's just start there then. Um, <laughs> why in the world would a girl from, where in Chicago did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Oak Park, Illinois. It's home of Frank Lloyd Wright and Ernest Hemingway. And I also lived up north there for a while too. I wanted to go back to school because, you know, when you're raising a small child, childcare is so expensive. And um, the jobs that were mostly available between eight and five required some type of training or degree or it's like all right I got to get back into this because that's what's just what, what makes sense. And so you applied to Adam State? I applied to Adam State. I actually represented myself um, against the father of my child to be able to leave the state um, and that took a year and a half process. <laughs> no money, <laughs> studied civil law and similar cases and I won and that's a very rare thing <laughs> to do. Um, and I showed proof of my scholarship to Adam State and it was a done deal. Did you initially declare your major or how did you navigate your field of study? I had already gone to school for interior design in Chicago and the market had changed for it quite a bit. And so I was like, okay, I need something a little bit more versatile. And um, I really, really took time looking at uh, degrees and I chose uh, business advertising. Adams really has a great program where they combined journalism, art, and business, all of which I was interested in. So that being said, you enrolled in 2009. Mm -hmm. When did you graduate? I walked <laughs> in 2013. Um, I still have a stubborn, lingering math class, which I will finish, but because of the politics and stuff, I hadn't done it. What was your degree in? What will your piece of paper actually say when it, you get it? It will say business advertising. And so during that process, you 
got very involved in the student government. You yes. were a student trustee. Yes. Um, talk about what some of those experiences were like. I had an English class. Um, another African American kid, you know, was there. We had discussed having some issues with kind of acclimating to the valley and acclimating to Adams State. You say acclimating. You're not talking about the altitude. <laughs> no, I'm talking about acclimating, like literally, like oh my God, there's you know this sense of culture that's lost. You know that we grew up with and you just assume that it's always going to be there no matter where you go in some cases or especially in university setting you're like oh my god they don't have these things I talked with him about maybe making a club or figuring out if there was a club for African-American students there was a BSA Black Student Alliance but it wasn't student government recognized you know very few activities so it was a club but it wasn't like an official student organization yeah, it wasn't an official student organization and what did that mean in terms of what you could or couldn't do with it? Well, I, I would say it would be hard for funding for events and things they wanted to do all around. If you're not student recognized or student government recognized, it's, it's pretty difficult. I think I started off as vice president and then went on to president. I changed the name to Black Student Union and got us associated with the Black Student Union Association nationally as well as student government recognized. That helped so many students just to be able to bond together and you know discuss our differences or similarities. Can we take a minute now and discuss this kind of strange relationship that you might discover you have as a student of color mm -hmm. at Adams State, a Hispanic serving institution. What, what does the term HSI mean to your average African American student at Adams State? Do, do you feel, is that what you're included in or are you something else? I, mean, um, I don't know if we're necessarily included in that, but at the same time there's the expectation of, I would say, the institution to serve students of color in that sense. And so you come here thinking, okay, okay, like this is going to be a place where they celebrate and, and support people of color. Was that your initial impression? And, and that was my impression. Okay. And then when I came here, it was like, not so much. <laughs> um, Were there and, specific experiences that brought that to light or was it just a general sensibility? Just constantly, like when you first come here, and this, this even happened to me today, people are like, well, where are you from? And you know, when, after you're here for a very long time, you're like, <laughs> Well, this shouldn't be so much of an odd question. Like you're not allowed to yeah, be from right. else. Surely you're from somewhere else. Yeah. I don't even know how to, to describe it, but it was very, you just sense it. You just, your interactions with people. And there are a lot of people here that aren't used to being a part of African-American culture socially. <laughs> so it's like you're a unicorn. <laughs> and so would you say that the obstacles you encountered were primarily within the university, the campus, or was it primarily kind of in that greater Alamosa area? Um, I think it was primarily within the campus. The Alamosa area, you know, even though that I was, you know, from a different place or whatever, were more than supportive and very welcoming and I never had any issues outside of, outside of the campus. Now within the campus, you know, as a student, like I said, it was just, you know, you're from a different place, blah, blah, blah. I guess the way that I carry myself is a little bit different from what they're used to seeing. And people would discuss like my way of speaking or articulation and I wasn't quite used to that. So this is surprising in some degree because the San Luis Valley, Alamosa, has very few um, African Americans, not none, but very few. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Adams State campus has a significant African American population. So right. one would think, oh, the campus at least provides this sanctuary environment mm -hmm. where there is more diversity, where that diversity is celebrated. But the greater Alamosa, San Luis Valley area is where a student of color might encounter more problems. Right. But you're saying... It's the exact opposite. <laughs> in which, and you know, you, you would never expect that. You know, um, I've been to other institutions, uh, other HSIs as well. You would think, okay, they're going to have uh, an African American studies, or this is going to be included in just the gen eds, and and that's what I had to realize that there were students that were graduating 
or that were even coming in and knew nothing about Jim Crow laws and, and details about the slavery and civil war. And I was like, what? This is completely foreign. This is something that I learned in, in high school. So to get this far, you're like, whoa. And then they might graduate and still not know it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Can I ask how many African-American professors you had while you were at Adams State? Zero. <laughs> did that surprise you? Uh, yeah, it did. It did. Because you expect the university setting to be more diverse. And especially it being at an HSI, you would expect to have at least one or, yeah, at minimum. There was one that came later on, Dr. Neely, but um, I was not in school at that time. And she was here for a year? For a year. For yeah. those who are listening that didn't already know this, Adams State has had very few African-American faculty, and there are a variety of reasons why. We, we don't really have to go into all of them here, but needless to say, you are not the first student of color that we've interviewed that has that sort of experience. Can you just in a sentence or two describe why having professors who are of the same ancestry as you or same ethnicity, why that's important? I think it's important um, because you're looking at, I don't just see my professors as just professors. I see them as role models. And so in this type of setting, you want to see professors of color that support your education. I even had, I think I was a student ambassador, and I had parents come up to me and ask, that were white, that had come up to me and asked, are there, are there professors of color here? Because that was their interest to expose their children um, to different cultures. And I had to sadly say no. But at the same time, I felt like Black Student Union, our club really, really supported teaching to some extent African-American culture and some history. Just to um, clarify, did the Black Student Alliance become the Black Student Union? Yes, or were they, okay. it did. It did. In Adam State's defense, it sounds like in that and in other areas, your efforts were embraced mm -hmm. and you were able to make what some would consider to be progress toward making a more inclusive campus for African Americans. Yeah, students. it was, you know, I, I let people know what I was doing and to try to get an idea of the support. We had pretty you know, positive reactions and great support while I was a student. Can you talk now about how you transitioned from being a student at Adams State to being an employee at Adams State uh, and what, what that was like? So my senior year, um, I was a student trustee and I had done very well with that. I think that was a great experience for me from becoming a club member to president of the club to then going to um, student trustee and VP of external affairs. Just learning, you know, Robert's Rules of Order, uh, being able to meet the, the governor, things like that, and representing Adam State. It was just was awesome. I mean, just awesome. So you very quickly springboarded into yes. a whole nother set of <laughs> a whole responsibilities. Nother set. And from there, there were several administrators that had saw my, my skills and said, you know, we have this opportunity, you know, would you consider, you know, going for um, admin for finance? And I was like, wow, don't really have finance experience. Well, well, why were you courted for that to begin with? Why do you I think do that was not, brought here? I, I think it was just my experience with, with being a trustee and um, going to the joint budget committees, explaining you know why Adams was such a good school and the progression that they were making very quickly at the time for non-traditional students. And uh, I did get the job. Um, I started off part-time. When was this? Um, this was April 2013 very little training, you know, here's what you need to do. Kind of trial by fire. Yeah, trial by fire. Mm -hmm. And I just worked it out the best that I could. Uh, not that long after I found out I was the first African-American female to work for a professional staff. And I think it, had I known that prior to, I might have made a different decision. Did that come with a gold watch or something? <laughs> it didn't come with a gold watch. It didn't come with anything. I think uh, there's this list of somewhere first for Adam State, you know, first person to do this, first person to do this. And I was like, I don't know if this is 
a good thing or a bad thing in 2013. Yeah, and I, I mean, felt like there should have been someone before me. Like maybe in the 60s or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, in the 60s, 70s, <laughs> somewhere in there, somewhere. It could have been in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> but by this time, there should be someone of, of African descent working in professional staff. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unheard of for a university. For those listening to the podcast thus far, it really sounds like your time at Adams was a success story overall and that things at Adams State were great. Mm-hmm. But you also also had some experiences that suggest that there were larger issues that you were dealing with. And did those Usually. did those mostly come up when you were working as a, an employee? It did. It did. Even so your time as so. a student gave you a pretty good sense of what you were able to accomplish. Mm-hmm. You saw some issues. You um, looked at the existing resources. You found people on campus, supporters and allies to help right. you know, remedy some of those situations. You right. saw measurable improvement. And so you go into the workforce at Adams State as the first uh, African-American <laughs> professional staff. What happened? The whole vibe was not necessarily welcomed. Maybe it was initially, but then when I started to do very well, you can kind of feel some tension as if I didn't deserve it. Like literally my second day, one of my coworkers told me, you know, the only reason why you have this job is because you were a student trustee and, you know, you were on the board and so blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, okay. You should have been like, <laughs> you should have been like, no bitch, it's because it was black. <laughs> And, you know, I took that, it, it, it sucked for that day, I, I, but at the same time, I took that and ran with it. I was like, okay, well, let me show you what I can do as, you know, just coming off being a student. And uh, one of my first projects was, as, as a part of that position, working with our insurance, and I found some funds that we were overpaying, and that actually brought back sabbaticals for professors. So they use some of that funding. So you found some funds that were basically being overspent on yes. insurance. Yes. And those funds were then retooled mm-hmm. and put back into funding sabbaticals for faculty, which yes. are which are basically opportunities for faculty to go off and do research and then present that research to the institution. Correct. So these are these are good signs. What are some of the biggest challenges or you know, things that surprised you about working in finance because you almost have a unique insight into how the university functions mm-hmm. that most people just never saw. Well, one thing was that was surprising was that it was such a different world. So I've always been used to, you know, working in groups, um, you know, working together with the university as a whole, and that was not necessarily welcomed. It was like, no, you're in this place, which we used to call it the dark side, or it was called the dark side for a bit, uh, because we were always, you know, we had a really negative, I guess, view to the rest of the institution, and I wanted to change that. You know, I wanted to be as transparent as possible, and that wasn't necessarily welcomed at all. So as a student, you probably had a significant degree of cross-department collaboration. You yes. found people across the campus that you worked with to make accomplishments. Sure. And as soon as you got into finance, that was not the case. You got a clear message that this is your compartment. <laughs> you are not to move out of this. You are supposed to stay in this chair all day long, <laughs> go for your hour lunch, come directly back, you know, don't, um, I have a very friendly outgoing personality and in budget, they're very much more introverted. And so I w- that's what I was like, you know, I've been extroverted like this whole time. So to, to have to change myself in such a sense was very challenging. And at the same time, you know, I have a job and I'm trying to um, you know, put food on the table for my kid. That's why I took the job before finishing my last math class. It's like, I gotta, I gotta do this now. So I was great, very grateful for the opportunity. I still learned a lot that I can take with me in so many different places, but it was one of the most stressful times of my life. And adjusting to not being welcomed, and it, you, at first I wasn't really sure if it was I didn't see it as a racial thing. I saw it more as like, okay, I'm a student becoming a staff and you know, people aren't happy about it. And later on, I started to see the breakdown just culturally not being accepted. You talked about this as being one of the most stressful times in your life. Yes. Can you talk about why or what was stressful about it? Um, I think that there was a lot of tension between administration. There is some transition. Um, Svaldi was planning on uh, retiring. We had a lot of projects going on as well uh, as far as construction that I was also assisting with. 
just we're starting to see a very dramatic change. It almost looked like a power struggle of who was going to have more control or who was more important or instead of you know collectiveness or a teamwork style of let's all work together to make this university great. There's points where you just have to be completely confidential you see things or conversations but man you're like oh my god this is a t behind the scenes a totally different ball game for what a student is used to seeing and it was also very disappointing too. Um, so as a student, you probably were on the receiving end right. of what Adam State's best functions were. Right. And then as not only a staff member, but working in finance, you saw a lot of the inner machinations of how things worked mm -hmm. and it was somewhat disturbing to you. It's terribly disturbing. And Can you um, give me some specifics about things that you, that came across your desk that you said, oh my God, there were things that were like pretty unorganized, but there were tons of things that would come across my desk and I would be like, uh, I don't know if this is supposed to be right or if this is right, but this is my job to just keep pushing this paper and um, keep my mouth shut, so to speak. Were there times that you were asked to do things that you felt were wrong? I don't know if I was asked to do things that were wrong, because they probably know I wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, but um, I was asked to not say anything about such and such and such and such, because it would affect a lot of the politics within the institution and within administration. And was this because these are matters that were confidential from a legal sense, or because if it were more widely known, it would have some political implications. It, it would or, have some political implication or, you know, just people would be upset about decisions that were made and how they were made. Um, so you carried a lot of knowledge around with you that no one could know. that no one could know, that no one did know, and that was, I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders because I'm conflicted between Yes, this is my job. Um, yes, I need to do this to make money. But also morally, this is not right. You know, you see certain things get funded very quickly. You know, certain departments or events or projects like boom, boom, boom. So you and basically saw where all the money went. Yes, and then you see other things that you think, wow, this would make a cool change, you know, to the university. This would be a positive effect. And they weren't funded. Or things that, you know, with being an HSI, you would think, okay, money would go here. That wasn't the case. So I got to see that really the funding was not supporting our HSI status. So budgets are moral documents. Mm -hmm. Every dollar spent is a way that Adam State, it's expressing its priorities, its vision, its values as an institution. What were some of the conclusions that you drew about Adam State's priorities, its values, based on the way that it spent and didn't spend its dollars? It, it didn't value the, the students as much as it should, and it didn't value the professors. For example, I remember when McDaniels um, used to be the, uh, what was it called? The ES building. The ES building. And everybody was so excited about the coffee shop going in there. It was supposed to be a coffee shop. And we saw the drawings and the renderings. We're like, yeah. And then when it came down to it, um, it was built wrong. And so it was supposed to have a different type of plumbing for an extra sink. It may have cost $10,000 to change it. But for the camaraderie that would have happened between the professors, the students, people coming in, having that open space, I thought, why wasn't that funded? I had, um, I had a faculty member when, because I was teaching when that happened, and he said, you know, this really is kind of a hallmark example of, of kind of what's wrong with Adam State, because they designed in this idea that, and we know that if students stay on campus more, they tend to do better in school, mm -hmm. they tend to interact more with their professors, with other students, and all of that has a net positive on their academic performance, but because you know, Sodexo has a contract as the right of first refusal for any uh, food 
services on campus. They ran the numbers. They looked at it. They said, this isn't in our best economic interest. So nothing happened with it. And it just kind of became this missed opportunity. And this is emblematic of you know how, how bad design prevented something from being more successful. Yeah, it was very disappointing to the students. And I think student government had discussed it several times and, and trying to find out what was going on with it um, because it was a way of students to study together. I mean, it was a, per a perfect spot considering that the lab is right there, you know, it's exposed to the outside and having such an open area and it just never kicked off. And, you know, like I said, it's something that simple. Can you give me an example or an overall impression of how faculty were not on the receiving end of many Adam State investments that they perhaps could have been? I think that just, you know, I see tons of faculty coming into the finance department trying to get, you know, questions answered or trying to understand if they're doing their budgets right or not. I did as best as I could to help them, but that didn't necessarily reflect in my other coworkers. Um, so not a lot of training or support. Not a lot of training or for support for faculty who wanted to understand. Yes. And I think that, that overall that could have changed the whole campus if people really got detailed training, an idea of what was wanted, what information they needed to show and there would be so much less confusion. Can I ask if it's intentional that faculty are sort of carved out of the financial or budgetary process at Adam State? I, I think it is, and sometimes I'd see um, other faculty that understood business or finance or anything tried to put their two cents or make suggestions, and they're completely shot down, completely shot down. So you would think that a business department, as far as the educational piece, and uh, you know, a, a business or finance department for the institution will work together. They are totally two different worlds. When I interviewed the co-president of Colorado's AAUP chapter, and I said, well, what decisions do you think that the administration should be making? Dr. Jonathan Reese said, administration should decide who mows the lawn. <laughs> You know, that they should not be deciding, like, you need professors and librarians and other professional staff to decide how a building is designed, right. to decide what goes into a facility, right. to decide how money is spent. And too often at Adam State and many other institutions, you know, there's this siloed group of people who are like who the made, budget wonks. Yes. And, and they decide, and then everyone else has to kind of adapt the way the, the tail wags the dog here. Right. You would also think that, I, I put myself in this position, I wanted to know more about the projects that were being funded just so I had an idea of what was going on. So you have one world where it's the budget and finance or whatever, and they're just moving these numbers for these different projects, but have no idea about the projects in detail, nor do they care about you know actually seeing them evolve. So perhaps managing budgets for departments that they've never visited with? No, or never visited with, never, you know, you would rarely ever see operating professionals or administration at those events. Why do you think people in budget and finance and other areas of administration should have a more on the ground experience with the way courses and student life and other areas of the campus are run? Black and white, it just makes sense. If you are moving this money or assisting professors and department and directors wouldn't you want to know what they were doing and how they were spending it and you know what the results were towards the money that you were funding for any event or any any project that's just to me it would seem like common sense that wasn't happening and that was very frustrating for me very, very frustrating. So was it often, frustrating because you thought you could change it or because you were told, keep quiet about this, this is how things are done, and you yeah. had no kind of input or agency in that process? I, I didn't. You know, I would kind of sneak in and, you know, <laughs> I'd walk into an office and overhear a conversation, and if I really, really said, okay, I have to put my two cents in it, because I have staff or professors ask me, hey, you're in finance, do you know this, this, and this? And, um, or, you know, they'd be talking some, about something in finance and, you know, hey, do you know this professor? And I'm like, yeah, and I can explain this and this and what their intentions are. So in a way I was kind of at a liaison for both didn't sign up for that job, but it was very, very difficult. I would observe that we have the jobs that were given on paper, and those are our responsibilities, but that any institution with a variety of complex human interactions 
has basic needs that people need to be met. And right. if your job description doesn't include meeting those needs, we're going to make an end run or we're going to move sideways to figure out how to make that happen. So I might not have anything to do with finance, but if I'm trying to figure out how to get something done, and I know Megan is the kind of person that can help me figure out how to navigate this, I will go to Megan, even if there's no prescribed channel by which, <laughs> right? No, it, it's, I, th I think that happens a lot at Adams where, okay, this is what your job description is, right? And you're like, okay, I, I got to get an idea, right? I'm, I'm cool with that. And then as you're working, you end up inhaling so much more uh, responsibility. You, were you ever pulled aside and said, all right, this is how things really work around here. <laughs> this is how things really go. I know what you've I been told. I don't know if I was pulled aside, but it was just like, this is how this is going to go. And you, you know, better do it and be quiet and, you know, take care of it. So yeah. I want to get to the cultural piece in a minute, but before okay. we get too far off of it. I want to ask, so if you saw student and faculty budget proposals being underfunded, mm -hmm. did you also see areas that were overfunded or that you felt like the funds were being kind of wasted or mismanaged? Yeah. And talk about... I, I, I saw that all of the time, um, especially with Title V grants and, you know, events and, and things like that. I was like, well, it was weird to me how things like Cielo and, you know, events that were crazy funded, but then you had things like CASA, which really helped the students um, and not just Hispanic students or international students. It was like a melting pot of all different kinds of students to have a sense of home and to learn about one another. They created, you know, these bonds and almost like family-like bonds. Why wasn't more, you know, funding put towards that? And I think it's also perceiving factor of, oh, we're not gonna go to CASA to actually figure out what they're doing and how they're doing it. We're just gonna make assumptions. I think one response people give is that, okay, look, almost everywhere on campus wishes they had more funding to do X, Y, or Z, and everyone yeah. wants more resources, and if they had them, here's the amazing things they would do. But you said you also saw areas that maybe money wasn't being well spent at all. No, it, was, it wasn't coming to the results. That's what I'm looking at. As you're putting money into any type of business or any type of project, you want to see a positive result of that. I saw what little funding CASA would get, you know, donations, whatever, and they, things would just be made to happen. So bang for their buck, dollar for dollar, right. CASA was able to CASA make it. CASA was able to make it. Uh -huh. And I'm so proud of the things that they've done, um, the students that have been a part of those events and projects and have done well you know, after they graduated because they had CASA. I mean, that, that's what made a lot of students stay. Yeah, and if, if Adam State as an institution values students staying, something like CASA would probably be a good investment. What did you see as some of the money pits or some of the areas that you saw, you know, lots of financial resources being directed toward but didn't see a lot of return for that investment? I, I really didn't see it with Cielo. I was kind of disappointed with that. I know it was supposed to be for faculty and staff, but I didn't see the change. Cielo so Cielo is basically a place for people to learn about inclusive excellence, mm -hmm. celebrate, recognize diversity, overcome right. challenges therein. I mean, those are noble goals. What, right. What's the problem there? Right. I, I, yeah, noble goals, but then you didn't see that exact result. I, I, I don't know. I didn't feel necessarily included in that. <laughs> or if it was welcoming. <laughs> Let me ask, when you were working in finance, were you encouraged to join and participate in these other groups? And what, what was that like for you? Absolutely not. I was actually told several times that I should drop Black Student Union because I needed to focus on the finance position. That was very disappointing to me because here I am trying to support other African-American students in the way that I was supported it was not accepted towards a lot of my coworkers and it was very unfortunate and instead of seeing wait a minute this is how Megan is supporting students like her and bonding with them so that they can be mentored into young professionals i was working my 40 hours there and another 20 towards helping students and staff and i will never regret that for the rest of my life it, it was stressful, it was hard. I did have to deal with you know, a lot of gossip or rumors or whatever, but I held it down and I'm proud of myself. 
So there was gossip and rumors. You had stress related to work that you described as one of the, the most difficult in your life. What were some of the consequences of that? So one of our first projects was working on a budget for East Campus to present to the state as to why we could get um, capital construction to renovate that space. I get, again, no training. Here's a budget. Here's the form. <laughs> Work it out. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified because I'm like, I'm writing a narrative. What if this doesn't kick off? What if this does not work? I do not have any experience in doing this. To see it come to fruition was like, oh my God, look at what I did. And you know, the, the institution got 5.8 million based on that narrative. And it took research of looking at other institutions and their projects. It took, you know, going to East Campus and seeing what was needed. You know, when I had said, hey, you know, I got this. Can this be at minimum put into my personnel folder as just, yeah, this is something that's accomplished. It was like, no, this is, you know, the day to day, whatever. So you didn't do anything different than what another employee would do. And I thought, how many other admin have got an institution $5.8 million? Uh, and not only that, coming f off of being a student. So and you threw yourself headlong into this project. It was a lot of stress, not a lot of mentoring or oversight. We could probably debate whether it was a good idea to assign this to you to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> but it did have a positive result and you wanted some recognition Just or at least to be able to. And I think that I had gotten the recognition in the beginning with the property insurance and, and finding what we were overpaying. And then I guess there's like a, a bad taste in other people's mouths and why does Megan get this recognition? And it also made me think, okay, what other things ha have happened within operating where people have achieved these things and not have been recognized? I often think that, you know, a lot of employees here aren't recognized for the things that they do and how hard they work and the, the time that they put in. And so I said, okay, well, I can't be selfish, but it hurt. And it, it sent me into depression. I, I felt like I wasn't welcomed. I'm doing all this work that, you know, I didn't even have experience in doing and doing it well. Nobody is appreciating it. And I don't, you know, I didn't expect like, you know, a big raise or anything. I just expect, hey, Megan, you did a dang good job. Keep up the good work. And, you know, let's see where it goes from here and let's work together to make this campus great. So overall, you found not a very supportive workplace. Not at all. And in place of being supportive, there was actually some envy or competitiveness or hostility oh, toward. Very much so, as if I was getting, you know, some kind of special rights uh, before people that have been there for, you know, several years. And it's just simply because I did something different um, and I have a different way of working and I, I can't help myself for that. That that was my talent. That was, you know, the way that I am. And I thought that that was going to be accepted as far as what I was bringing to the table. Can you talk a little bit about a time or two when you tried to use the institution's own channels to be able to resolve an issue, whether it was going to the Office of Equal Opportunity or elsewhere, and the success or lack thereof you found? At some point, I decided to go to HR, go to the Office of Equal Opportunity, and that was terrifying. It was terrifying because it was like, you are doing a bad thing. You are exposing something that we have been trying to keep secret. And you know, this is the way things go. Sorry, you don't like it you know, kind of attitude. I have always known for human resources in any type of organization to be somewhere to go to get something resolved. That was never the case. Even the, like the simplest thing, you're like, oh my God, I want to avoid going to HR. It's going to be a hot mess. <laughs> so, you, so you go to HR to get a problem resolved. You end up made to feel like you're the problem. Right. And how dare you right. bring this how across the desk. How dare you, you know, say anything? How dare you make a complaint? Would Even, you mind giving me any detail about the nature of the, the complaint or complaints that you'd filed? I, I, I will say this now about Bill Mann time now we're cordial cool civil but i think the tensions between politics at adams you know frustrating situations with people 
we had some really, really tough times. So it would be fair to say that though you and Bill are cordial outside <laughs> the workplace, right. that as an actual supervisor, the VP of finance at that time was yes. not an especially easy person to work oh, for. Oh, he wasn't. And I was kind of prepared for that. I was like, look, I've had tough bosses. Let's do it. You know, uh, we had our times where, you know, we worked like really well together and like, boom, boom, boom. We worked on this project. Okay, you got this done, you know, kind of try to keep him organized. Uh, you know, uh, keeping his appointments together. And then there were times where I knew that um, my coworkers had affected his opinions about what I was doing and were making complaints. And so he stuck between, okay, here's someone that is supportive and trying to work hard and doesn't have any experience in what she's doing, but doing the best she can. And then here are her coworkers where they could provide training um, they have this experience, but literally wouldn't. You know, I'd ask a question and they'd be like, yeah, too bad. <laughs> and so I had to figure it out. I'm like, okay, well, this is what is going to happen. So was there a resolution to the complaints there, or there, the concerns there wasn't. that you raised? I ended up getting a horrible, horrible, what do you call it? Evaluation. evaluation. And I was like dumbfounded. Like, what is this? One's across the board. So I you have an like, annual evaluation. Yeah. I and asked you had for an one. expectation. Oh, so you asked for one. I asked for That's your evaluation. first problem. <laughs> you should have just kept quiet and I not asked to be evaluated quiet. on your workplace performance. I totally just kept quiet. I was like, wait a minute. I haven't even gotten an evaluation yet. I've been here for a couple of years. And so I don't even know how I'm doing, where I'm going, and what I'm supposed to be approving upon. And um, I think your job description was see no evil, hear no evil, speak no much, evil. Pretty much. Pretty much. And then, you know, when I started to dig deeper on, I am dealing with really, how do you say, high priority projects. Why did you guys give this to me? And because I've done this, is it right for me to have? Should we be putting this in another position? You know, should we be changing my title? Because this is a lot of responsibility for an admin. What about your evaluation did you feel was unfair? There was a ton of things. I mean, having ones across the board almost makes you feel like, oh my God, am I going to get fired tomorrow? And, and one is the lowest number. One is the lowest number. So you'd been working there for two years. Yes. You'd had no kind of previous intervention to mm -hmm. address workplace performance or whatever. You asked for an evaluation. Yes. Why did you do that? I, I did it because I wanted to know um, places where I can improve. You know, I wanted to also kick off solidifying my job description correctly because it seems like, okay, I'm doing admin work, I'm doing finance work, I'm working on, you know, Moody's uh, bond disclosures. Whoa. <laughs> and um, property insurance. And I had no experience with that, but you know, when the scoreboard got struck with lightning, guess who had to take care of the situation and figure it out and, and you know, got us $100,000, you know, from the insurance to, to take care of the situation. And that was on my own. I'm talking to high exec people and, you know, Hanover and Pinnacle Insurance and was terrified, but made it through. And so I thought, okay, th this is a little bit deeper than what I, you know, noticed. And also I was paid the same amount full time as the person before me who was also working part time. And I was like, that really doesn't make any sense. Why is that the case? So you were working full time and getting paid what your previous position holder was mm -hmm. getting paid in a part time capacity. Yes. And that seems like a pretty obvious issue. So that was one of the reasons that you requested this that evaluation. Was one of, that was also one of the reasons. And when you got the evaluation back, it you got was, a bunch of ones, yeah, bunch which of is ones. unsatisfactory performance. Yes, crazy unsatisfactory. So I was also in charge of writing the minutes for the president's cabinet meetings. Again, had no experience with that. Um, these are very detailed minutes, two hour, one hour meetings, 28 people. And with all these different opinions, that was one of my most stressful projects because how those minutes were written, the things that we were discussing, you know, very confidential. You know, certain people felt like they should be written this way. Certain people felt they should be written the other way. As someone and who's read my share of minutes, others have expressed to me the frustration that there's an important topic, let's say funding for a particular program. And all you'll see in the minutes is program funding was discussed. Right. Who so, discussed it? What did they say? Right. <laughs> I would try to write it as detailed as I possibly could. I recorded the minutes. I, uh, spent so much, so much of my work time was on those minutes. 
and I kind of felt like, hey, this is overwhelming. I got some bad feedback as far as, you know, how long it would take me. Um, In other words, it was taking you too long to record these minutes. It was too long minutes. or there were errors. And I feel like that should have been, you know, something that myself and someone else should be working on at the same time. So if I'm writing, somebody else edit or vice versa. But having all of that, you know, and then making sure that everybody's point is made. Sounds like it was difficult to please everybody. Yes, it was incredibly hard to please everybody. And this is the president's cabinet. Um, I used to talk to Svaldi and have really, you know, good conversations. And um, he was great at mentoring me on, you know, how they should be written. And, you know, also advised me to look at um, James Trujillo's um, minutes as an example. But when we made that transition to Blavie McCour, it was don't speak to her about the minutes. It's for president's cabinet, so I don't know how I wasn't supposed to have that communication. So you were directed by who not to speak to the new president, Beverly McClure, about the minutes for president's I cabinet? I would literally email her constantly about how something was written or can I meet with her about the construction of the whole meeting, the transparency, everything, and I was shut down. A number of times we've talked about issues that really go back to transparency. Right. Things that you were told to keep a secret, that politically we just don't want this getting out there. Adam State seems to have some serious transparency issues, and you were on the receiving end of a lot of the areas about which you were directed to be opaque. Yes. And so what did that end up looking like in terms of your day-to-day -day work where there was so much you couldn't share, and it blatantly contradicted all of these public statements about how transparent Adam State was and how accountable Adam State was. It was complete opposite, and that was part of the issues with the evaluation. So I'm like thinking, like, okay, well, I'm I'm doing all this work. Why am I getting evaluated to this degree? And um, why was I told this as these things were happening? And now I'm finding out in an evaluation. That's kind of crazy. So needless to say, the evaluation was not good. It did wasn't you get great. the opportunity to respond or appeal, or I what did. happened next? I responded with um, I think six pages of my own notes and then also 60 pages of evidence supporting those notes. Um, and, and you, I, of course, you were doing all of this in addition to your job, In addition right? so to my job. One can't imagine why this is stressful. <laughs> and yeah, and, you know, Bill and I had ended up going through the evaluation piece by piece, but it was at first very hostile. It was at first very tense. That first initial meeting was recorded. There were times where he raised his voice and I was like, well, why are we at this level? And it's all like hitting me at once. Like I've been told that he's kind of a, a desk pounder. Oh was yes, there... a desk pounder and all of it. And I also had to deal with not only my own issues, you know, that I'm trying to solve with him, but the issues other people had with him. So it was, you know, to be his assistant automatically gave a, ba a bad taste in p other people's mouths. Like, oh, you work for Bill Manchime, so da 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 da. It's like, no, I work for him. I don't agree with everything that he does, but I work for him. <laughs> Did you get the impression that you're being set up to be fired or what? I thought so, because like, when you get ones, you're like, okay, I'm about to lose my job tomorrow. <laughs> and I was terrified when you're raising you know, a little boy and you are you, the head of household. I, that was the most terrifying thing I ever experienced in my life. And so we worked together to try to solve some of that to some extent, but there was never a re resolution of all of the things that I was taking on as being an admin and, and looking at my responsibilities and pay. It was like, oh, you're just first level clerical. And I'm like, since when does first level clerical work on capital construction projects? or property liability. So duties <laughs> as assigned was not really commensurate with the job description, the compensation associated with it, the workload with that position. So was, there was a lot of really messy components. There was tons of messy components. Um, I would constantly contact HR. I have several emails that were never even responded to. So your efforts to contact HR to have these things resolved were ignored? Completely ignored as far as the position of what that detail and just 
description was supposed to be. It was just like, no, you're just clerical. As the state says, blah, 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 blah. You're at, you know, 72% of Koopa and all that. And I was like, well, this is completely not even right. When, when you look at that position at other institutions, they're at like an admin level, you know, three. <laughs> just for people listening, there's two kinds of problems here. One is you're being paid 72% of what people in a similar position at other universities are paid. And the position itself is not correctly classified so that you aren't even at that kind of peer recognized level of the work and the duties assigned. So it's not even like you're just getting 72% of what others in your position make. You're getting 72% of what people in lower positions than you at other institutions make. Yeah. And I, as I was doing more research, you know, I, I got more and more disappointed. And it wasn't that I was being greedy. It was that I wanted to make sure that my workload was correct for what I was being paid. So were you sure essentially seeking more pay or less work? Um, probably less work because I had some really, like I said, extensive projects. When you're working on property liability management, capital construction projects, president's cabinet meetings, and also assisting someone, that is crazy. Crazy. This is about three different people's it's jobs. Like three different people's right jobs in there. I mean, in one. it doesn't really make sense for you to have done the president's cabinet meetings anyway. No. Secondly, it sounds like some of the compliance, insurance, and capital construction issues should be handled across several positions. Yes. Would it be fair to say that when you weren't being ignored, you were being criticized or castigated? Oh. So either you'd get no feedback and you'd be ignored, or when you got feedback, it was pretty hostile. Yeah, it was. And I, I was told that I would get some of those projects or responsibilities because they knew that I was a good writer or they knew that, you know, I was, you know, had the abilities. But at the same time, is it right for myself to be overwhelmed? And this is not something I saw just in my position. This is something I saw in several different positions. And so that's what I, when I would talk to, you know, other faculty or staff and they'd be like, yeah, well, I do this and this and this. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a universal problem. <laughs> we got some huge issues here. And this is why like some people decided, hey, like this is too much. I'm gonna decide to leave or whatever. As a part of that, I was asked, okay, what positions or what type of thing do you feel like you should be in? And I said, you know what? Admissions would be great. So just to be clear, some of the issues with your evaluation just weren't resolved. Mm -hmm. Around this time, Bill Mansheim had a personal loss and also essentially decided to take early retirement. Yes. And so because those things happened, there was going to be a new VP of finance. Yes. There was transition with the administration. It's a lot of loose ends. Yes. A change of culture, uh, an old president that used to mentor you mm -hmm. on how to construct meeting minutes, mm -hmm. and a new president you were told not to talk to. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so amidst all that, it sounded like your workaround or the one the institution helped to craft for you was, we're going to put you in admissions. Yes. Do you think that was their way of kind of punting and not actually addressing oh, the for, substance for of what you had sure, been? For sure, for sure. And I took it and rolled with it because I wanted to get out of such a hostile environment. I mean, it's to the point where, okay, um, there were complaints that, you know, I was off of work or whatever. Um, and it was really because of the stress and the workload and, you know, lack of support. So stress led to you taking some family medical leave or what was it, going on? It led to me first having high blood pressure, um, having several panic attacks. I have a reoccurring cyst. If I'm under stress, it becomes even more sensitive. And so um, that was flaring up constantly. You um, know, let me just say, when I started this podcast series, I knew I would be talking to people who had some workplace stress, disappointment, etc. I didn't realize now in a number of cases, people became really physically ill mm -hmm. as a result of what Adam State placed upon them. Uh, definitely. I, I went to sign myself up for therapy because I needed to talk to a neutral person about what I was going through and if this was normal, if, if, I, if I was crazy. Like, you wanted to make sure that I was mentally healthy um, because I have the responsibility of, of raising a small child. 
I mean, there are days where I was like dreading going to work. Like I would have to pull myself out of bed and be like, why am I doing this every day? Why am I putting myself through this? So you got to a point where you really didn't even want to get up to go to work in the morning? Not at all. And that's not usually me. I'm usually like, okay, I'm going to sweat this. It's hard, but I'm going to make it through. And when you clearly see that things are not going to be resolved, that um, you're not going to get anywhere, you know, you're not going to, even if you put that much effort into whatever or years into whatever, you're not going to get promoted. <laughs> Would it be fair to describe your workplace as a hostile work environment? Oh, completely. I mean, when you have to the point where your coworkers don't even say hi to you or, or good morning or anything and you're just sitting at your desk, why am I working this hard to be a part of something that doesn't want me there? So you weren't getting recognized for your achievements. Nope. You were being heavily criticized in your evaluation for things that hadn't been brought to your attention. Too much work for too little pay. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of healthy direct communication about improvements, mentoring, support. And in the background of all of these things, you're trying to raise a son and get by making a living. Yeah, so people would ask, like, why didn't you finish that math class? And I'm, I'm like, going to ask the same how? <laughs> how was I supposed to do this and raise a child and work full time and support a club all at once? And it wasn't necessarily that I was taking on too much. It was that too much was put on me as a responsibility. You know, working in admissions, I wish I had started sooner. It was a much better environment. I could use my extroverted skills. I was excited to be on the road. And it, you would think, you know, being on a road nine hours, driving to Texas and all these different places would be stressful, but I was ready to go. And that's what made me really know that, okay, I literally was not being supported in the finance department, but I was much more supported in the admissions department. And it was a much healthier environment for me. How long did you end up working in admissions? I worked in admissions for six months, and then it got to a point where politics and stuff that was going on within the institution also then still became overwhelming. Where is this institution going? <laughs> so you had a better day-to-day -day work environment in admissions, but there were still some of those previous issues that raised their head. Yes, yes, and so then it, here I am, appointed by the president to another position and people are pissed off. Uh, the same even, people from finance or uh, different people? Just people in general. Like there, there were tons of employees that were just, hey, you know, why does she get to go from this place to this place to this place? And is this really earned? And it wasn't, it was a lateral transition. I didn't get any extra pay. You would <laughs> think that people would be happy for one another in an environment where people succeed and that your work when, you know, cause I would observe that when you're in as stressful as a position, not wanting to go to work as you were in finance, mm -hmm. you probably weren't doing your best job even if you wanted to. No, no. And so being in a place where you looked forward to and enjoyed the work you were doing, that helps you, but that also helps Adam State because that means that you are more effectively helping the institution to meet its mission. And rather than being happy for you in that, it sounds like some people were hostile or snarky about that. Very, very much so. I continued again to work with BSU. I created our first office, which I was really excited about. So this is all while, you know, back and forth being on the road and being on admissions. And a lot of people weren't happy about that office being created either. Uh, and that's where I was like, wait a minute, I've spent so many years, you know, being a part of this organization. And now that we are going to get an office to support African-American students, I'm getting some really terrible feedback. You start to think more of, okay, all in all, is this the place for me? When I'm on the road, it's like that question comes up. Do you guys have African-American professors? Do you have any other African-American staff? In you know, some level, you really have to believe in what you're selling. Yes, you have to believe admissions. in what you're selling. Um, and so after the trauma that you'd experienced in finance right. and some of the challenges you experienced as a black female going to Adam State, it might have been, pardon the phrase, a little bit difficult to drink the Kool-Aid. Oh. <laughs> Yes, um, it was difficult, and I, you know, I started to be on the road, and I'm pitching Adam State and the benefits that it, it has had for me as a student. But as a professional, I would kind of be like, okay, no, we don't have African American professional staff or within a faculty. We do have you know, tons of sports uh, positions and, and where African Americans are within that, but that also looks very stereotypical for the university. 
how do I pitch that as being a Hispanic serving institution? As we joked about before, <laughs> there's also that house on the edge of campus that makes burritos. <laughs> There's the house on the edge of campus that makes Yeah, so yeah, and you know, you'd, it's funny to hear people talk like that. And I'd be like, no, this is what CASA is about. And this is how awesome CASA is, and this is what it brings to the institution. One of my main selling points to, you know, students was CASA. The fact that we had that. Which is like the footnote on the end of some line item on a budget. Yes. <laughs> was whatever was left over from this pool of slush fund or whatever. Right. Right. Did you find yourself looking in the mirror and saying, do I really believe what I'm saying? Right, right, literally. I was like, I'm putting my foot in my mouth every time. And I'm, am I bringing students to a healthy situation at this point? So, so you, were, you were essentially responsible for bringing students to a campus yes. that you didn't necessarily believe in. Right, a lot of students of color. I was the only African-American in admissions and I'm... Were you strategically deployed in areas that <laughs> you were more likely oh, to attract so African-American like, students? Anything that was black related or African-American related, it'd be like, call Megan because Megan knows what to do. And so having that pressure and but not having that title, you know, I'm not a director of anything, uh, cultural activities, I'm just an advisor to a club. And to be fair, you don't have a lot of professional training in that area, but you are a black woman. Mm -hmm. So thank God I do it well. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean that, yeah, that that was my, you know, intention. And I was also kind of, I think it's the obligation. You know, it was like, hey, you have to do this because you're an African-American woman on this campus. So you had an unusually <laughs> large burden to carry on your shoulders Completely. in both your workload and the, the heavy lifting you were doing culturally for this institution, given your demographics. Completely. And eventually I just had to make that decision decision to separate myself from the institution, which was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life. Given what you've been through, why was that a hard decision at all? It, it, it was still because I was so passionate about Adam State and I developed myself as a person here. I, I completely developed to who I truly was and I got a better understanding of what I could do in the world, what I could do, you know, within an organization. Um, I developed so many skills. Would I be fair in summarizing that you developed this reputation as a troublemaker? Uh, eventually I did because I was a whistleblower. I'd stopped being as confidential. I stopped being subservient. What were some of the areas that you blew the whistle on or that you refused to be subservient? I would literally say, hey, you know, if you want more African-American students to come here, you have to support that. You can't rely on me to support that. It's the professors, the staff, everyone has to be a part of that. That's just not, oh, well, Megan, you do it. Okay, you recruit them and you retain them. <laughs> that shouldn't be all my responsibility. You and you'd be like, to. me and what army? Right, Like, right. what resources like, are we getting what to resources accomplish am I this getting? Task? You know, it, I was asked to draft a document on recruiting African-American students, but I was in finance at the time. And I was like, why would I do this? And am I getting paid for this? Because this isn't a, a, in any way part of my position. With all the emphasis on recruiting students, Hispanic, African-American, non-traditional, or otherwise, do you think there has been sufficient emphasis on graduating those students? No, not at all. The people that you would think that was, should support that and should care about that, don't. And that was discouraging. Just imagine, okay, from being a student and then gradually seeing, okay, this is not why we're here. We're here because of numbers and because of, we want to look, you know, have one black person on our marketing <laughs> you know, pieces and so we can draw people in. I remember, you know, a story about myself um, was posted for like months and, and I eventually said, hey, can this be taken down because... A story where? It, it was a story in the A-Stater. So the A-Stater is Adam State's alumni magazine. Yes. And it was a story about you. Why did you want it taken down? I wanted my picture from that taken down because I didn't want to be this marketing piece as to getting African-American students here. So to be clear, was the story about you? Yes, it was about me. Transition mm -hmm. to coming from Chicago and being here. And I, I was proud of that. But then it got to be like, okay, there's other students, African-American students that have other great stories. Why aren't you interviewing them? It's not that there was something about the story that bothered you, mm -hmm. but it was perhaps how overly prominent yeah, it became. Yeah, it was overly, it was like overly done. And I was like, no, there's 
are so many other students here that have great stories too. Did you feel like a show pony? Oh, I did. I felt tokenized. I felt that would that was hard for me too when I realized more of that was the direction of how they were using my existence here, I became greatly depressed. I mean, in, in a way, what's sad is that you, in some ways, you became more of a mascot than you, you were an integrated part of the institution. You know, they wanted Megan kind of in name and image only as they could display her to the public through admissions and through the A-stater. But when it came to who you were, the way you interacted with people in the positions that you held, they didn't want the real Megan. They wanted the <laughs> idea of Megan right. as presented to the public. Right, yes. So it. I, I had the choice between you are the black girl or black woman at Adam State or you are Megan Smith and I chose to be Megan Smith. So yeah, at the end of the day you have to do what you have to do. Um, I have, it took me a long time to heal from this. I mean, my family had great concerns. I mean, you're describing this as an incident of trauma, not, yeah, as, it was not as a job that you had to make some money. Traumatic, traumatic, and trying to support. What, can you give me a thumbnail sketch of what, what, what was traumatic? Like in retrospect, upon reflection, not just this or that, but overall, what was traumatic about working at Adam State? When there started to be a couple of other African-American professionals that came through, to working at Adam State and they of course are going to looking for my support they literally said had we not seen you or talked to you before you know during our interview we wouldn't have been here like it okay well let me tell you it's not all you know <laughs> uh, fairy tales here and unicorns it's it's you know pretty intense also realize what you're signing up for and so this is one of the problems I see is that a lot of your values and day-to-day -day actions, your core morals and your job description were out of alignment. Completely. These weren't things that, that created a unified self for you. Like you had a version of Adam State that you sold to the public. You had the version of Adam State that you yourself experienced. Mm -hmm. And then when a peer or a colleague came to you, you somehow had to navigate the waters of what was confidential and what wasn't, what you were allowed to mm -hmm. Say, what, what you should be saying and what your real day-to-day -day experience was. Right, and th that's when it, it really came to a head for me was that we aren't being welcomed like we should and we aren't being supported. And so when you're at an institution for eight years, even as a student and professional, you're like, we should have it together right now. There should be no excuse. Being in finance and seeing, um, part of our job is to um, look at job descriptions and you know the hiring process and blah, blah, blah. And I literally started to see that it was not being welcome to have Hispanic professors uh, or professors of color. And I was like, this is disgusting. How could we have this funding? How could we you know, claim to be this type of institution? And they don't even want, you know, there's tons of people that do not want people of color here or don't want to support the HSI status. And, and that's a pretty bold statement. I mean, some people sort of think that Adam State doesn't attract or retain more faculty and staff of color or Hispanic descent because the pay is low, it's non-competitive, there are things about the San Luis Valley that just don't appeal to people. Mm -hmm. But you're saying there are active elements within the institution that do not want that kind of outside diversity? Completely, completely. It has nothing to do with, I think that that's a very, ignorant statement to say that um, a person of color wouldn't work here because the level of pay that they're getting. There are people that love the Valley. There are civil rights professors that I have spoken to that have done you know, events with us that wanted to be visiting professors and that was shut down. It that, was shut down on the basis of pay or what's the official reason why uh, this can't happen? It was happen? just the idea. Like, there were, so there were people out there that were willing you know, it's so like when you find somebody that's, you know, willing to come to the Valley and deal with all these, you know, complete differences from what their normal comfort zone is. And then you don't have the institution to support that. And you're like, what are you guys doing? This is, this is part of our mission. Uh, it should be the same type of recruitment. Can we talk a little bit about the role that athletics plays at Adams State, both in terms of recruiting students and also in terms of the financial component that Adams State invests in, in its athletics programs? The recruitment process is completely different for sports than it is for the rest of the institution. That's what I learned um, as a part of being in admissions. Different how? A different how that the athletics program has a totally separate recruiting 
position and that does not coincide or work with admissions at all. So okay. in other words, the, the standards and protocol for admitting students who were athletes was different in nature? Completely different, completely different. And not it, good different. And no, not good different. It's very confusing. So you're like, okay, you were already admitted, you're ready to get a schedule, but we haven't, you haven't gone through this whole other process in which the, the rest of the university has to go through. Was it sort of assumed that once a student is admitted as an athlete, the rest of the institution has to kind of fall in line and green light that process? Pretty that much. you can't like raise a flag and say, actually, you know, their academic or other performance or credentials don't align with our admission standards? For sure. For sure, and it was a very that was one frustrating process of being in, in admissions that you, you would constantly deal with with those situations and be like, okay, well, we're just gonna go through the rest of the process. Like now, we're gonna make you go through the regular admissions process and you know look at your uh, transcripts and blah blah blah, so that we can get you into you know um, housing and everything else correctly. I mean, this just seems like another area where you were basically told there are certain ways that things have to be done, and even though your training or your best judgment would suggest otherwise, here's how things are going to be, and don't talk about it. Basically. <laughs> this is, I don't think it was even that much. It was just like, this is how it's, it goes, and just work with it. Again, you're just going to do the best that you can, you know, get the student package right, make sure that they have the proper testing that they need to, to take and go from there. But it was a strange process. I, it is no harm against, you know, tone with athletes. I'm saying it's unfair to them as well because it gives a bad tone. You know, you're just here to run. You're not here to get educated or you're just here to play ball and not here to get educated. As a faculty member, I did have many students who I would say, well, tell me about yourself. You know, why are you here at Adam State? Or they would present to the class and they would say, I came to Adam State to wrestle. Mm -hmm. or to play football mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just, as a faculty member, that was always so perplexing. It's odd. It was like, you're paying all this money just to, to run. You can do that <laughs> anywhere. Why would you, why would you pay, you know, or have to take out these loans and, you know, do all this just to be able to be on a team? And I found myself often thinking, okay, so what does that career path look like for you? Right. What happens after? Are you going to the NFL? Yes, yes, yes. And so, and not to say that every athlete, that that was their situation, but we come across that quite a bit. They were very disappointed too. That was the other thing I was learning. They were hurt that they weren't supported the way that they should be. Sometimes you'd see them leave or just literally not do well um, or just you know have a really stressful time and that was very disappointing. Who do you see as some of the worst offenders in terms of what it costs to run the program, the students that are recruited into it, and their ultimate success in attaining a degree from Adams State? I had mentioned this as a student trustee, and I said the football players talked about all of our sports and who had the highest or lowest graduation rates, and, you know, I felt like I was being ignored. I was like, well, shh, don't say nothing. Yeah, this is not the kind of subject <laughs> that you're supposed to be bringing as up right now. As a student trustee, no, I should not be talking about this, but I felt like it was my obligation. Like, hello, this is important. You guys, we need to figure out how to do this right. So I want students to be able to play hard also work hard and get degrees at the end of the day. They shouldn't just be here for a couple of years and transferring to other institutions. It's frustrating to see it interrupted. And then the financial commitment that Adam State has made to its athletics programs in terms of capital construction, in terms of the staff, in terms of the ongoing costs of transportation, equipment, you saw all of those line items on budgets. And as a student yes. who went through Adam State and as an employee at Adam State, you had to have some opinions about that I, topic. I did. Like I said, I have friends that are athletes, and so I don't want to discourage them or think that, yeah, I'm talking against them. In in any way but at the same time when you have such a top of the line facility and then you have family housing that looks worse than public housing in Alamosa that's sad that is devastating and that is something that you know Dr. Svaldi um, had discussed um, one of the things he discussed before he left and while I was a student trustee that that's something that we needed to improve upon he's like we're bad landlords. <laughs> and um, as part of being property insurance and liability, um, I would constantly get, um, you know, this is broken in family housing, this is not working, you know, blah, 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 even just to get 
you know, facilities to go over there and fix everything. You would see tons and tons of just documents on projects they needed to be working on. And I'm thinking, this is not only where our non-traditional students are, but their families, their kids. So Adams just essentially doesn't allocate funds for family housing and for other types of facilities, and so you just get substandard living conditions uh, yeah, for people? Yeah, they do, but it's to a certain extent, and they could do a whole lot more. There's just no excuse for it. As, as many funds as coming, why wouldn't you? And morally, again, if you're a part of budget, if you're a part of finance, and you're running this, and you're literally seeing broken down housing, why aren't you making the decision to clean it up? I'm, I love the, the athletic facilities. I think that they're, it's beautiful. It's an awesome selling point as far as recruitment, not only to just athletes, but you know other students. Um, but then you gotta walk around family house and be like, what's that? <laughs> so it's an eyesore on campus and it needs to be taken care of. In kind of the final analysis, did you plan on staying at Adams State for longer? I mean, initially, was Adams State somewhere that you wanted to work for longer than you did? Had things gone differently? Hey, I would I would have been a lifer. I would have been, you know, I was ready to say, okay, we, I can do this. I can live in the valley and was a city girl before this and had not been fishing and camping and all of that. And the valley exposed that to me and welcomed me and I would have done it until retirement. When I started, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna get my degree, go. And then I got sucked in and embraced. Um, you got sucked in in a good way. In a good way. And then. And then I got pushed out. You got pushed back out. <laughs> and it just, yeah, again, became overwhelming. And when you start to hear that down to your your personal life, you know, things you're posting on Facebook is going to affect the institution or influence certain students. And I was Can like, Can you what? talk about that for a minute? Well, you, you, so you had a, you're, you have a Facebook account. I do. And what, what, what issues did the so university the take with that? the last couple of months, we, you know, we're going through uh, voting for our new president. Again, you're, everybody's going to have an opinion. Or, when you say our new president, you mean of the United of States the United or of Adam States, States? States? Of the United okay, States. Okay, so the, the Clinton-Trump yes, election. Yes, we're going through that election. You know, people grow up in different ways and exposed to different things. So I don't necessarily judge people by, you know, their support of Clinton or Trump. But at the same time, I was also taught by Adam State <laughs> um, in mass communication and in journalism to make sure that you, um, you know, show both sides of the argument. And I went to a rally um, against Trump. And Where was it held? This was in Denver. In Denver. I drove up with my son and I had taken lots of pictures and there were tons of like for Trump or not for Trump. I took a picture of this particular sign that said America was never great. And I thought it was crazy. And I literally said that like under in, on the post on Facebook that this is nuts. Like the people that people could actually say this. And I was told not in great detail, but just by my boss that there were people that had looked on my Facebook and said that it was inappropriate and would affect other students in the institution. And I was like, what? So the fact that <laughs> Megan took pictures of signs at a rally in Denver, yes. posted it on her personal Facebook page, yes. wasn't like tagging Adam State and uh -huh. saying, hey, I'm representing Adam State at this rally. No, no, no. Where I'm Nothing a like that. civically Nothing engaged like individual. Completely on my own personal thing. And it was also really to show my son what was going on in the world and, and exposing him to that. And I don't think there is anything wrong with that at all. And he had a lot of questions and I, so I felt that was the best way to inform him. This is my own bond with my child. At some I'm point. not asking you to take it down. I just <laughs> want to let you know that it's, it's wrong. There we could never, we would never ask you to take it down. We're just going to subtly or not so subtly imply that your ongoing employment at Adam State is contingent upon behaving in a manner that comports right. with. That had happened a, a couple of times. And then I think someone had brought, actually brought it to my attention and I didn't even realize it. I was the only African-American in Richardson Hall, aside from the students that were a part of working in part of facilities and taking out the garbage. And I was like, oh my God, that is so embarrassing. I mean, being the first <laughs> right, at something being the first. also means being the only. Being the only, I think Chris Rock said it. He's like, you don't, you never want to be the first. You want to be like the 15th. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be the first African-American president. You want to be like the 15th. So all the, all the stuff that is, 
you know, controversial about it is done with by the time you get there. So you posted on Facebook about, oh my God, why am I the only yes. African American why am I, why is this in Richardson I said, Hall? Adam State needs to support people of color more and I'm the only one. I did get a nice little letter in my mailbox from the president requesting for that to be taken down, as well as to have a meeting with her about um, my post and how I felt, and she asked for me to be more of a support. So this is the same president that you were told not to contact and that yeah. ignored some of your attempts to have clarity on president's cabinet meetings. So you weren't getting that productive communication mm -hmm. at the workplace when but, you oh, requested was, it. Yeah, but was, when you dared to make the observation <laughs> <laughs> that you're the only black employee in Richardson Hall, uh -huh. you got a direct message from the president asking oh, it to be taken yes. down and asking to meet with you about this issue. Yes, and I was eager to discuss it with her. I think it was literally within 24 hours we had a meeting and I just expressed to her how I felt. I was like, look, man, this is, this is something I've been working on since I was a student. And I literally said, I will work with Adam State until it had you know, more African-American staff and faculty because that was my, one of my main goals. And this is, you know, these are ways that we can, you know, improve upon this, but I, I'm gonna be, you know, quite honest with my feelings and it, there's nothing wrong with that. No. That's completely human. And it's it's a strange situation where you find such a large African American student body, you know, relative to or about what the national population is, mm -hmm. and then finding almost no one who works at Adam State that meets those same ethnic background. Yeah, it, it started off small at first. I was like, okay, I'm here, it's 2009, and there aren't that many African-American students that are not in sports. And then after I developed Black Student Union more, we had certain marketing strategies, it boomed. And now we had a ton of non-athletic African-American students, but they have no support. And that is incredibly disappointing. And she, I know I had written some, you know, ideas and suggestions. She told me to do that, but that never pulled off anywhere. I mean, so you were, you were asked to come up with some suggestions, sure. but you didn't see even at that point, and this is kind of the 11th hour at your time at Adams State. Right. You were in admissions. Right. You were essentially a few months from what we'll get to in a minute, which is how you actually left Adams State. Mm -hmm. But you had a new president, mm -hmm. which is essentially a new audience for which you can express your concerns mm -hmm. and perhaps get resources or support. And I was support. looking to be very excited about it. I was like, yeah, in the beginning, like she was like, okay, you know, like I want to talk to you about this and this and this. And you know, yeah, you know, let's, let's do this. And then we did get funding. I said, yeah, we need funding towards the Black Student Union if you want us to do this. And she had said to talk to student activities and student affairs about it, and which I did, and later grew to us having an office. But at the same time, it was still like pulling teeth. <laughs> and um, I was, it was weird, you know, we see things get funded, you're like, okay, I know how easy this is. I know the process. Why is it having to be going through all these crazy different avenues just to set this up? Can you talk now about your decision to resign or leave Adam State, the terms of that decision, and also then we'll talk about kind of just the emotional component of letting go of a place that you've been to for so long. There was one particular instance uh, where we were having an event for non-traditional, it's Chris Gilmer was in charge oh. of it. So last November, there was an event to commemorate the creation of the National Center for Historically yes. Underserved Students. Did you attend that event? I was not invited. Did I, you need an invitation, or what um, was the what was the? Uh, yeah, because it, there were specific in invitations towards certain professors and faculty and staff. So um, in other words, other people on campus who were employees were invited, were invited to attend, to and attend you, the one on the cover of A-Stater, the, the first African-American staff in Adam State history, you just didn't make the cut. I didn't make the cut and I was livid. I was like, I just opened a Black Student Union office, so wouldn't I be invited to something like that? And so I was really disappointed. I reached out to Chris Gilmer 
and he had told me that the uh, invitations were vetted by President Beverly McClure. And was this before or after she told you to take this stuff off Facebook? It was way after, way, way, way after. So the, the center's commemoration mm -hmm. happened after McClure had asked you to remove this. Yes. So if you weren't already on her shit list or whatever, <laughs> You weren't oh, exactly. I definitely was now. And then I realized that level. I was like, wait a minute. So we're not looking at this is what Megan has provided to the institution for so many years. We're looking at now Megan as an individual and maybe being a whistleblower, maybe supporting Danny Ladoni and being friends with Danny Ladoni. <laughs> that association too. Was you like, fell, in okay. you fell in with the wrong keep crowd. You couldn't keep your mouth shut. Couldn't keep my mouth shut. All kinds of problems. You know what I'm looking like? Did you guys not know my personality in the beginning? The, yeah. the, that's I've always been that way and I'm not changing that for anyone no matter how much the risk but you have to have a, I have a moral standard and I, I just can't you know keep my mouth shut just because it looks cute to everyone else so was not being invited to the National Center for historically underserved students was that kind of the final straw for it you? Was, it was, because considering how much that I have been involved in supporting those underserved students how could you not invite me. Chris Gilmer had a huge apology letter. It gave me the details of what it was about. And I had actually had an event for Black Student Union in Richardson Hall as a fundraiser, um, our usual soul for fundraiser. But the first time was in Richardson Hall. I had the people that were invited to come into the university from that event come to the fundraiser. And these were other um, professionals that come from historically black colleges that have been involved in supporting underserved our students of color at other uh, organizations or institutions. So this fundraiser really did align with a lot of the same populations and the same mission and values. It just happened to be around the same time. <laughs> We were planning on having that event and I was asked to do it on this particular day and we were going to have it later on this week and we thought, okay, well, I'm not invited. We're not invited. So you were asked to move the fundraiser yeah, to around it, the same time as the center's yeah, it opening. Yeah, was a suggestion because... But you they, weren't invited because to... Because people knew that I wasn't invited, <laughs> they said, why don't you do this to make sure that they know you exist? I'm trying to figure out whether this is something that was like a subversive act to show that you <laughs> will be counted and that you will be seen, or whether it was an afterthought to say, oh yeah, and then um, Megan's thing over here. No, 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 no. It was a subversive act I wasn't even included in any of that and also there were no students from Black Student Union invited to that event as well so they, no they, students they from Black Student Union later as of like the day of that it was happening like a couple oh yeah 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 you know let's get some students from Black Student Union and then they had drawn the speakers from that event to come to the fundraiser. The students are like, hey, you know, check out our office. You know, Megan did this really cool thing for us. We've been working really hard and we're having a fundraiser, come check us out. And I thought it was so cool to be able to speak to them on things that I was doing. I had explained how we had gone to Jamaica to give school supplies to uh, an orphanage. And we'd gone to New Orleans to see the devastation, the Treme and the Ninth Ward and Washington to visit the the Martin Luther King monument when it first came up and how that affected the students. And they were like, this is great, this is awesome. And they were like, wait, why weren't you at today's event? And I was like, oh. Because I it's wasn't Adam State. Invited. And they were like, wait, 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 what? And they were like, well, how many other, you know, people of color here? Or, or I was like, well, most of the professionals of color are in athletics. When I had to reiterate those words to people that had worked with Obama, <laughs> that was my realization that this is not where I should be. The opening of this center attracted some nationally recognized speakers and participants. Mm -hmm. They threw this sideways happenstance of <laughs> running a fundraiser for Black Student Union, mm -hmm. encountered you, who were not invited to this event. You then almost had this externalized experience where you were seeing Adam State through their eyes, mm -hmm. and what it 
must mean for you to describe the conditions at atom state having almost no faculty or uh, staff of color and the only employees at atom state who are African American or predominantly in athletics and you weren't invited to this event for historically underserved student populations you thought this can't add up to a place where I can continue working no there was no apology from the president you know, like I said, Chris Gilmer was very much like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, da 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 Well, if it makes you feel any better, Beverly McClure doesn't apologize I know, to anyone I know. about anything yeah. at all. But that was my realization of saying, okay, this is, we're dealing with a totally different ball game, and it's disappointing that an institution can change so much based on so few people. So you came to Adams State in 2009, mm -hmm. significantly less uh, African-American population. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a black student alliance mm -hmm. that was not officially recognized. Mm -hmm. You made major headways in a variety of ways as a student trustee to help form the Black Student Union, mm -hmm. becoming the first African-American professional staff at Adams State. And by the end of your time, it almost seemed like things were sliding backward or didn't go much of anywhere at all mm -hmm. on the issues that you threw yourself into and cared about. Right. You had been actively reprimanded in all of these other ways. So you probably took a look at the whole situation and said, this doesn't add up to being worth the amount of stress, difficulty, hardship yeah, that I've been under. That, that was it for me. It was devastating. I had literally went to sleep and woke up one day and said, I'm writing a, a resignation letter. And in detail, I put in there why I was leaving and how I felt um, that the institution wasn't supporting um, students of color and staff of color as it should. You know, I give my my time that I was going to be working until and, you know, a good lengthy time, like six weeks before I would leave. I didn't want to just So you like, gave six weeks notice? Yes. And then uh, I was told after submitting that to my supervisor and Beverly McClure, uh, I would have to leave the next day. So you put in six weeks notice yes. and they said, tomorrow's your last day. Tomorrow's your last day. Like literally HR, my supervisor came in and said, hey, we will pay you until the date that you said you were going to leave, but we would like for you to leave your office tomorrow. Why do you think that is? There's a number of you know reasons that you could possibly come up with. Maybe they thought that I was um, going to interrupt whatever or make cause problems, but that wasn't the case. I literally wanted to properly say my goodbyes and properly leave professionally the institution in the right way. I didn't feel like, you know, just giving, just doing two weeks would be enough time to leave the things that I was working on. So you'd been at Adam State since 2009. Yep. You'd been an employee of Adam State since 2013. Yes. And when it came time to put in your resignation, you offered a detailed letter with a six week essentially transition period because mm -hmm. you were working in admissions. Mm -hmm. And after what amounted to seven years, they said, no, you can leave tomorrow. Yep. Pack your things. Goodbye. Did you get a big going away party nope, in Richardson I sure Hall? Didn't. I did. I sure didn't. I've seen that happen with other employees, and that hurt. I could also see that you know people that I would usually be close to being scared to be close to me because they're afraid of the association and what people might think. And that was also hurtful too. Was this because you resigned or just prior to that? Or it, was it gradual? It was, it, it was gradual. It was like I was very verbal on what I thought was wrong with the way the institution was heading, very verbal with us being put on probation. And, you know, I saw this. As a student trustee, I said, uh, I'm concerned about these things. So you were a student trustee <laughs> what year? Uh, 2012 to 2013. So 2012, 2013 was two years before the HLC investigated Adam State, mm -hmm. a full year and a half before the Chronicle published an article called Confessions of a Fixer. Yep. So you as a student trustee saw... I saw those things. Um, there are certain avenues where I did speak to trustees. I, saw, I spoke to administrators about the things that I so saw. So you did blow the whistle did on blow the whistle. issues that you saw. Was it specifically with online coursework or what, what, what were you concerned about? I was concerned about the graduation rates. I was concerned about math classes and failures. 
I had talked to a number of students that were just like, either one, I quit Adams because I cannot do this math class. Two, I have had to take, you know, six different math classes just to graduate um, and ways to help those students. But that's definitely affecting our graduation rates. And I had no problem telling administrators um, and showing proof in detail about why this was going on. and you know, giving testimony of other students that I had spoken to that were afraid to speak up. And so once you had raised those issues, did you see them addressed in any way? No, absolutely not. As a consequence of raising these issues, you experienced some difficulties interpersonally with other people at Adam State? For sure, for sure. You know, some people like to jump on the bandwagon and they don't want to rock the boat because they're, you know, I understand they're trying to get paid and take care of their families. And yeah, I'm a little bit of a risk taker, but morally it was just really difficult for me to see that and not be like, what are we doing? Was there any other effort to reach out to you to try and figure out what was going on, et cetera, to try and make things right, essentially? Never. You then probably went through this emotional journey of thinking, I have six weeks left here, I'm going to complete the work I'm doing, etc., to basically being instantly ripped out of this community that you had been in for seven years. Not only did I feel that way about just the community that I've been in for seven years, I felt really guilty about the people that I recruited to Adams and were looking forward to me being there and looking forward to being a part of Black Student Union and um, CASA so the, and everything The people else. that came to Adams State because of you, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And were, then you were gone. Yeah. I certainly felt the same way. I felt a whole lot of guilt. I was like, wait a minute, I've been on the road trying to get all these students here. I, you know, they're talking to their parents, talking to some of their teachers um, that were very excited about them going to Adams in the, in the fall. And I felt like I was letting them down, but I had no other choice. If uh, they listened to this podcast and you had an opportunity to say something to them, what would you want to say? I would say, regardless of all the politics and things that you hear, Adams is still a very, very special place. And take from it what you can to improve yourself, to uh, develop yourself, and don't let that be um, a deterrent. I, I just would say just don't be discouraged and um, you know work it through, get that paper. If there's something that you could say to your colleagues at Adams State, the people that you worked with throughout your time there, who just saw you disappear one day, and there's, when people leave Adam State, there's usually not a lot of fanfare, ceremony, even explanation as to what happened. Mm -hmm. And so the rumor mill starts to persist oh, yeah. about why they left, and I heard this and that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty terrible, because when the institution doesn't meet its basic communication functions to say, this is why this employee is gone, mm -hmm. everyone ends up speculating about why they left, and usually the most salacious explanation tend to rise to the surface. What would you say to the many people that you knew over your time at Adams State who came into work one day and you just weren't there anymore? I thought about that really, that was heavy for me to, to digest and I felt a lot of guilt and it took, I got a, a huge healing process, but I always say it, I don't blame them for, for working there. Of course, it's a, it's a very special place. And I would say if you see an opportunity where you feel like you can leave and make it somewhere else, do it. You have to balance what is best for you and your situation, and I'm never going to judge at all. Is there anything you could say to your critics or the people who perhaps didn't understand <laughs> why you did what you did? Any any myths or misunderstandings oh you'd like to take goodness. the opportunity that to dispel? Such a loaded this such a loaded, loaded question because I'm not thinking of anyone know, in particular, but perhaps just, you are. No, just in general, because I know there's a lot of people and they have questions or ideas or assumptions of my level of professionalism and you know, I've been volunteering in, in Denver um, at uh, Denver Art Society, I'll say it, and immediately they saw my skill set and jumped on it and um, accepted me. And actually, I did get a going away party <laughs> when I left there. 
Uh, moving At the on. Denver Arts Society. Yes, so, yes. I mean, this is an interesting <laughs> contrast that you're not the first to observe. Look, if you work anywhere in any culture long enough, you begin to acculturate and reposition your idea of what normal is. Mm -hmm. And for you at Adams State, you kind of became accustomed to a certain way that, that you were treated or handled, etc. And you then worked somewhere else and discovered that you were recognized much more immediately for the skill set that you had, that you were valued for it. Uh, and then when you left that institution, you were given a going away party. Yeah, they were are like they were in awe that I was leaving. Um, I got an opportunity to work for a friend in Chicago, and that's where I'm from. And it's it's going to be great to go back home and take this awesome skill set that Adam State has given me, and take it back to Chi Town. And I could not wait. <laughs> I'm pretty willing to, to go out on a limb here and say it's a skill set that you developed while at Adams State. Yes. But Adams State, it doesn't sound like gave you a whole lot other than grief. You know what? I will say, um, as far as my education goes, it did give me um, a lot of insight and opportunity. And I will agree, I did have a certain gift, but there were certain professors that I had support from that said, you got this and continue to do it and I will never regret that either. Um, I appreciate all of them. Looking back on it, is there something that you would have told yourself along the way that could have helped you to survive or be more successful or to be healthier in the work that you did? Uh, maybe a takeaway lesson, how to survive within Adam State finance or just in general? I would say that <laughs> giving myself advice, I'm like, you shouldn't have done it for more than a year, girl. You should have been gone. <laughs> You, you know, after seeing how things really were, I put myself through a lot and it was more to sacrifice to support others, so I don't regret that. But at the same time, my body, my health, my mental health went through a whole lot and I had to mend from it. And um, I have very healthily and, you know, all that, but at the end of the day, everything is solved. I do not have any lingering conflict with, with people, it, it was what it was, it's done, and I'm moving on to the next. I'm thinking of someone that we both know who <laughs> had a very difficult time leaving Adam State. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone who is trying to figure out how to tie up those loose ends, how to transition and move on in a healthy way after a difficult situation working at Adam State? I think that you have to heal. You can't let that stuff linger because it'll eat you alive, you know, and it'll start affecting the new things that you're working on. You have to go back and look at what you brought to the institution or, you know, the, um, the friends that you made. You know, I could say that I didn't just develop our friendships with people, I de developed a whole sense of family. And that is more valuable than any of the conflicts that I've had. And just to focus on that and move on. Well, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you.